Greetings. Hey, thanks for joining us here on the Business of Agriculture. I'm your host, Damian Mason, and you knew that already because you just heard the introduction. By the way, you can do more than just listen to the Business of Agriculture. You can now watch the Business of Agriculture. We launched recently a playlist, so go to YouTube and type in Damian Mason in the search, and you then can find my channel, and you can subscribe to it. I really would like you to do that. That way, more people will be able to find my awesome videos, and also this podcast, which is now a podcast in audio form and video form. So please go. It's D. Mason Comedy is the actual YouTube channel. Harkening back to my political comedy days, D. Mason Comedy is the actual YouTube channel. Please go there, subscribe to it, and if you want, go ahead and uh, pick, you know just kick around for a while. Watch whatever videos uh, suit your fancy. You can even go back and find some of the old vintage stuff from my political comedy days, or my agricultural commentary, or this podcast right here. So, Here's what we're talking about today. The problems with China. Some of you are going to disagree with some of my sentiments, and I'm okay with that. I at least can give you the reasons that I say it's time for us, more than ever, to say, screw China. Okay, now, and I know it's going to get political because some of you are already going to go down the political road, but this is not an overtly political assessment. This is a what is best for us as a country and as an industry long-term assessment. All right, real quick. What do SARS, H1N1, avian influenza, the Spanish influenza epidemic of 1917, and the current coronavirus outbreak have in common? I'll give you a second. If you guessed they are viruses that had devastating impacts throughout the world and they all originated in China, you'd be right. Oh, but China. Oh, but China. What are you talking about? It's the Spanish influenza. Yeah, I don't know why they call it that. I wasn't alive in 1917. But you know, it killed more people than World War I, which is pretty damn devastating in and of itself. Mustard gas, trench warfare, trench mouth. If you don't know history... If you don't know history, look it up. But the influenza epidemic of 1917-18 was devastating. Much more than this thing that's going on right now, this media-perpetuated coronavirus, which is going to end up probably... My prediction, it won't even be in the news come May. I'm recording this right now in March of 2020. Early March of 2020. March 9th, to be exact. But I'm predicting that we won't even hear about the coronavirus come May. And if you asked any average American on the street in May, two months from now, hey, what was that devastating virus that was going around a couple of months ago? Uh, yeah, man, something like a, something like a corny, corny thing. All right. I know that I'm probably sounding jaded. You're probably saying, wait a minute, Damien, you know, there are people that are going to die from this. All right, let's put that in perspective. There, so far, as of this very second that I'm recording this podcast right now on March 9th, 2020, there are 22 deaths, 566 confirmed cases. Puts us in about the 4 to 5% uh, death rate, uh, which is pretty high. It was less than that over in China. Now, that's high. It's also 566 people in a country of 330 million. Uh, one Col- uh, Columbia University epidemiologist, uh, researcher, scientist, gave a high variant projection, a high variant projection, and said it could be as many as 10 million people die in the world within a year or two of this coronavirus if we don't get it contained. 10 million in a world of 7.6 billion. That's one out of 760. Now, wouldn't you safely say that out of 760 people in the world, every 760 people, wouldn't you say that one dying out of every 760 is actually, you know, pretty, pretty small? Uh, but let's say, it, you know, it, it's, that's, we're talking about a pretty small, it's, well, again, one in 760. And what about if that one in 760 was probably going to die anyhow? You know, a lot of the people that are dying from this are in nursing homes. You ever been to a nursing home? Those people might feel lucky that they're finally getting the hell out of there. I promise you, I will never go to a nursing home. I will take a walk in the woods on a cold winter night with a, with a, with a bottle of whiskey and uh, lay down to rest. I, uh, yes. So, I'm off, I'm off here, but I just want to point out that we're overreacting. But that's okay. Right now, as I'm recording this, the agricultural markets are tanking. The stock market is tanking because the oil, uh, the oil war that's going on between Russia and Saudi Arabia. But you know what? Once there's panic in the market, then humans show that they are emotional overreacting, irrationally behaving little sheep. And that's exactly what's happening right now. 
But back to the bigger point about the business of agriculture and China. Why am I so anti-China? Let me just tell you what China has done to the world. China has used what economic might it has, and as it's arisen here in the last 20 years, to build up its military dominance and also to throw its weight around. China, it's time that we stop tiptoeing around this, because we in agriculture, in American agriculture, like, oh boy, we sure got to straighten things out, China, oh, those tariffs. And I've already gone on the record, and I've pissed off some of you agriculture people, because I have told you, a tariff did not create $9 soybeans. Global supply, or even oversupply of said soybeans, is what created the market price. Yeah, but if China started buying, prices would go up. Well, maybe a little bit. But are you, are, you, are you convinced that China was fasting for the last two years? Do you think that since 2018, when the trade war started, they just stopped eating? No. They bought beans from Brazil, which means then wherever Brazil was selling beans prior to that, probably needed beans, which means they could have bought them from us. Oversupply of commodities is what we had uh, create the commodity prices that we have. We became very enamored with this idea that China is our answer. And we did this to our own detriment. We are an export-driven economy in terms of agriculture in the United States. We got 330 million people. We produce way more than 330 million people actually need. That's why we need export markets. I get that. I agree with that. In fact, that's completely fine. But there's an old saying in business. An old saying in business. If you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank owns you. But if you owe the bank a hundred million dollars, you own the bank. Now, you get where I'm going with this? China, very smartly, and, and, and frankly, it's because of our laziness. As an industry, we allowed this to happen. What we did is we got so good at just, because we're amazing at producing commodities. We, in American agriculture, we just love to produce commodities, and we're good at it. You know what? We said China's got this rapidly expanding economy, and they're going to buy our stuff. So you know what? Let's keep on feeding the world. Our favorite statement, feed the world, feed the world, go out and grow the commodities, produce corn, produce soybeans, produce wheat, produce pork, uh, you know, produce milk. By God, let's figure out a way to sell it to China. So there we went. And China, very smartly, let us become dependent on them. Okay? So the old thing about who owns the bank, who owns who? China realized that we, or thought, we didn't have a choice, that we would just give in to them and we would just have to take whatever the deal was because, by God, they owned us. Well, we've seen that that's not necessarily the case, and now they've got some real problems. Their manufacturing sector has slowed down a great deal because we stopped buying their crap. Also, they got the coronavirus, and they're shutting down towns, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you got a slowing global economy. Anyhow, you got a whole, a whole economy that's been looking for reasons to stub its toe. It's remarkable to me. I swear to God, the media does this so that we can, uh, you know, they know that humans are sheeple. And so they realize that if we just create enough emotion, there will be a scare. And boy, oh boy, do they love to run for the exit screaming fire. That's what's happening right now. But back to the reason China is a problem. As I know, here in agriculture, we talk about it all the time. We, you know, we heard Sonny Purdue came out and perpetuated the myth that commodity prices were because of a trade war, which is not really the case. Again, so supply on a global level had much more to do with that than our trade war. But the big problem is we had uh, become dependent on China. China then stops buying our stuff. So that's a glut. China, at the same time, uh, has bought our biggest pig producer here in the United States of America, uh, Murphy Brown, in conjunction with Smithfield. China also uh, has going around and opening up all these other uh, suppliers, uh, realizing that they don't want to be dependent on us, that we are dependent on them. You see, what, what we would do well to understand and move forward with in agriculture is that we got real sloppy and we got real lazy and we only depended on China or too, became too dependent on China, particularly for things like soybeans, etc. And China knew that. And China doesn't want to be our customer. This is where we kind of have this whole entire, it's almost like we're, we're almost like naive. We think that China wants to be our customer. China does not want to be our customer. China wants to be our replacement. China wants to replace the United States of America as the dominant global economic superpower and global military superpower.
There's a reason they're starting to do saber rattling and, and, and fly the jets and shoot off, you know, weaponry and all this kind of stuff in the China Sea. They're doing this because they want to rattle their sabers and they want to replace us. It's a pretty big order. Now, when I hear people say it's probably going to happen in the next few years, I say bullshit. I say bullshit and I'll tell you why. They are not innovative. They are a communist country still. And more importantly, they're at about 13% of the globe's GDP. Right now, and of course it's shrinking because they've got some problems, they're about 13% of the global GDP. We're about 24 25%. So we have one-fourth of the globe's economy right here in the United States of America. China has uh, 13%. Uh, they got four times the amount of population that we have and about half of our economy. So they got a lot to do to catch up or overtake us. But it doesn't mean that they're not going to try. They have the long view. We tend to be, to our own detriment, short-sighted. China has a thing called the Belt and Road Initiative going on. Are you familiar with this? And again, this is where I point out to my agricultural compadres we do ourselves a disservice when we think that if we just patch things up with China, everything will be right with the world. Everything won't be right with the world because China will use us, abuse us, use us to manipulate. They loved, Remember what they did? They put news into the marketplace to drop prices, and then they would be the buyer once they used their economic influence to drop prices. China doesn't want to be our trading partner. They want to be our replacement. China wants us to buy their cheap shit and their manufactured goods, and then they want to uh, use us as a supplier, but only when it works well for them economically. So, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, great article here. I, I should probably put the link up, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great article. It was uh, more of an economic article. Um, I just picked this up. It's from uh, January 28th of this year. Uh, I think the, the source is MPBI, I think is what it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an economic data thing. But uh, the best part is it talks about the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is begun uh, about uh, 2013 um, by President Xi Jinping. And they uh, basically are recreating what was known as the Silk Road. Back in the days of the Crusades, you had uh, Europe and Asia and these, you know, transfer of goods. So it was the Silk Road. If you know anything about history, you can go and talk about that, where, you know, the moving spices from uh, Asia to, to uh, Europe, and then whatever, metal goods probably from Europe to there. So it's kind of a modern day Silk Road, and this is a huge Chinese objective. They intend to spend about $1.3 trillion, $1.3 trillion between now and 2027 on infrastructure improvements in other countries. Countries that right now do business with the United States, but China wants to replace us. So they're willing to make a long-term investment and they go to these third world type countries or developing countries and say, we will bring infrastructure. We will build railroads. We will build roads, ports, airport, airplanes, airport strips, whatever you, you landing strips, whatever helps your economy. But for that investment, of course, we want to stay involved. What's the biggest problem that Brazil has? Is it agricultural productivity when it comes to agriculture? Is it the productivity or is it the infrastructure? Answer, it's the infrastructure. So China immediately has buddied up with Brazil because they knew that they can play us against them and them against us. So China is spending Belt and Road Initiative monies in Brazil building roads and railroads and ports and things like this so they can get those soybeans from what was once Amazon rainforest but has been bulldozed and sliced and burned and turned into fields. They can then further their environmental degradation by putting all that stuff on a boat and getting it over to China. Okay, why am I telling you this? Because again, China does not want to be our customer. They want to be our replacement. They're going to use this Belt and Road Initiative to extend, extend their influence all throughout the world. $1.3 trillion on an airport here and a railroad there and a highway here, that gets a lot of stuff moving and also puts China now in all of these countries. The United States used to do this through military bases and through economic aid. China's not doing it through economic aid. China is doing it by investing, saying we want to be a partner here. Okay, continue going down this road. And why I say it's time that we get ourselves off of the China teat. 
It is time that we realize that they don't want to be our customer. They want to be a replacement. It's time that the business of agriculture continues to look elsewhere and bang on more doors for other business and then also double down back home on value-added products. You see, the world has enough commodities. That's why there's $9 soybeans and $3.20 corn and under $5 wheat and whatever these numbers might be. I, admittedly, I'm not an agricultural commodity trader. There are people that are expert at that. Uh, I got a C in Ag Econ 320. It's just nothing that I really, really wanted to do. I didn't want to look at every day at the damn grain charts and get excited about a three cent move. Point being, I know the stuff. I don't do it every day. Other people are expert at it. I can tell you that whether or not we have a, a trade deal straightened out with China or not, we still are going to have low commodity prices because there's lots of it. Sonny Purdue just announced last week not to count on a MFP, the margin protection uh, plan that uh, they gave $16 billion last year to agriculture. He says don't count on a third wave of it. I disagree. I believe that it probably will end up happening because we're still going to be in a slow price uh, marketplace here for the next several years. Bigger point here about China and what we really need to look forward to. We need to look forward to a future where they can rattle their sabers and it doesn't move our markets. And we do that with other trade deals. I see good things happening with Europe. I see things especially happening with Great Britain. It has spun off and is no longer part of the whole European Union because of the Brexit thing. Now, that doesn't replace China. That's what you're going to tell me, and I know that. But Mexico uh, helps. Uh, South America helps. Uh, the Canada USMCA thing is going to help. And there's probably some good to be made here out of this current crisis with Japan. Japan and China hate each other. Japan and China have always hated each other. And Japan is an ally of the United States of America. I think we have a real opportunity to go back into what was the TPP that China, again, was using to dominate that whole Asia-Pacific area. And we might be able to do some good capitalizing on China's weakness. One of my cohorts who speaks and uh, is a host of the U.S. Farm Report, I just saw on a social media feed yesterday, said that a hobbled China doesn't do the United States any good. I disagree. I believe that a hobbled China is actually good for the United States because it puts us back in a position of strength and power, and it also realigns the global economy so that folks realize, oh, China can't come in here and just swing their weight around. Let's go back to China's problems. They have given the world a great deal of unhealth. Let's talk about what China's done. Again, the avian flu, the, the H1N1, and the uh, SARS, and now the current coronavirus. Economic impacts throughout the whole world. The EU economic minister uh, predicted, I think, or it was either EU or France, I just read this article this morning, about a 0.2% uh, decline in, uh, in the economy over there because of what is going on with the uh, disruption caused by uh, China. Let's go further than that. African swine fever. Finally, the numbers are starting to improve. The article I just uh, did uh, research this morning, the China swine herd is actually back on the rebound. They never gave us straight answers. That's the other reason we need to say screw China. They lie. They cheat. They're a communist country that dictates uh, information uh, that the rest of the world can see. That's the reason we have this coronavirus outbreak being worse than it really should have been. Because they stifled information and they are still a developing country that uh, is a very finger down, uh, top down, uh, communist ruled dictatorial society. <clears throat> The reason we need to look at China with such suspect, we need to look at China with such uh, suspicion, is every deal that we ever come into, we think this is good for us, it usually ends up being not so good for us. Uh, you know, they bought, our, they bought our biggest pork producer, but is that really what we want? They also gave us African swine fever. They gave the world African swine fever. We, we are now, according to agriculture.com, they were at the uh, a pork conference. It was just held this week. Uh, in this weekend, and they're talking about what we might have to do to contain African swine fever if we get the bug. And I'm not sure that China would mind if we did. Uh, you know, if you look at the United States as your adversary, something that weakens their food system is good for you, right? So, if we do that, we have all the protocols in place because we have an amazing U.S. Department of Agriculture. We have an amazing American Veterinary Medical uh, Association. We have an amazing protocol uh, system in place on how we can manage this. That's why we don't have hoof and mouth disease, and that's why we, we eradicated things like bovine brucellosis and things like this. But 
If we get this, it'll be one more thing courtesy of China. SARS, H1N1, avian influenza, coronavirus, African swine fever, and then let's not forget their other track record. You know, I'm a forestry guy. I've got 60 acres of woods between my farmland properties. I manage my woods for long-term timber value. And guess what? The Chinese have also given us emerald ash borer. If you're not from the Midwest, this may sound unfamiliar to you, but it came over on container ships with all the packaging and the pallets from China and infested starting in lower Ontario and Michigan, worked its way into Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. The emerald ash borer has eradicated the ash tree. Now, there's biological controls being uh, released. I think it was Michigan State University that found some uh, predators to the borer and putting it out there. But as for the here and right now, uh, one of my chunks of woods, 25% of the species were ash. And guess what they have as a value now? Absolutely nothing. The economic impact of the emerald ash borer, and I'm using this as an example because we in agriculture, we don't think as timber being agriculture, but it is. Every time we think that somehow we just need to patch things up with China, I can point out another problem with doing business with China. Doing business with Mexico, it didn't give us the goddamn emerald ash borer. It didn't give us SARS. It didn't, get, it didn't destroy our hog herd or have the threat to destroy our hog herd. You know, China lost a third of its hogs. Some, some estimates say half. China officially said somewhere around 20 to 25%. They're lying because that's what they do. So... We don't lose or have our ability to have our swine herd devastated by doing business with most, most other countries. But in doing business with China, they are bad for the world's health. From an environmental standpoint, they're bad for the world's health. All the environmental do-gooders are here in the United States protesting against cars and all the different things that we driving and telling us we all need to be in Priuses. Meanwhile, over in China, a National Geographic article from about eight years ago stated that every four months, China was bringing online an, an equivalent of Great Britain's coal infrastructure. Yeah. So every few months, they were opening up a coal-fired power plant. Now, they're not doing that so much moving forward, but they did. Their environmental degradation is substantial. Uh, and then they give the world African swine fever and then all these other human-borne illnesses. So we continue to think, oh, let's not, make, let's not make China mad. I want them to be our customer. We need to move on. And I'll tell you why. They're generally a toxic relationship. You remember about five years ago, Chinese nationals were caught on a Monsanto facility in Iowa trying to steal genetic uh, trade, uh, genetic trade secrets, basically. They were, they were on a, a test farm trying to steal, and they did uh, get apprehended, stealing from Monsanto. These are not our friendly trade partners. These are our economic adversaries. I know I'm a little off here compared to what you hear. If we could just get this thing straightened out with China, by golly, we're going to be back to 2011, back when we had all that expensive commodity prices. No. That's not going to happen for another couple of reasons. The rest of the world decided that they wanted to make money also. Ukraine expanded. Kazakhstan expanded. Argentina, Brazil, Australia, India, all these other countries expanded into that huge, huge commodity boom that we saw between 2005 and 2013. So a straightened out uh, business arrangement with China, if you can even have an honest, fair, legitimate trade arrangement with China, is not going to bring those commodity prices back. So I talked about African swine fever. Bad for us, bad for the world. You know, it wasn't necessarily bad for a while that they lost their hogs because that opened up a bit more of demand for our hogs. But what if we end up with the bug in our swine facilities and our swine industry? took about a year and a half, two years uh, for China to even start to make headway against it. We would do better. We have more advancement. We're also better with information sharing. Uh, but if you see uh, it come to the United States, there's also speculation that we're going to have to depopulate, which means to eradicate, to kill off uh, hogs on farms. It'd be good. It'd be price positive. Obviously, it'd be very supply uh, be very supply reducing, um, but it also upset the apple cart on our industry right when we uh, might have an opportunity to do more on a global level. So let's hope we don't get that. But 
China's been pretty good at spreading diseases around. The other thing, and I wrote an article about this a few weeks ago uh, and put it out there, you know, coronavirus came from the open-air food markets. So, again, when uh, we talk, talk about how harmless uh, China is and how they'd be great to be our customer, let's remember that um, they also still have open-air food markets where there's live animals. Some of them are wild species that have been domesticated that are disease-ridden, and that's where the bug came from. Allegedly, it was transmitted from bats, from some sort of a food market in the uh, central part of China. Tell our customers, for a little side note here, tell our customers, the last time you were standing at the, at the Albertsons or the Winn-Dixie or the Kroger meat counter, you didn't run the risk of contracting coronavirus, now did you? Ah, you mean the food system here is safe and plentiful, and you don't get inf infected with viral uh, viral outbreaks by going to the grocery store. All right, I gave you all this because I know that some folks people don't uh, don't look at the bigger picture of what China's all all in end game is. I shared that thing about the Belt and Road Initiative. If you're interested, you can check it out. Just go ahead and type in China Belt and Road Investment or China Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the, the infrastructure they're doing around the globe very much then paints a picture that their intention is to spread their own economic influence, to spread their military influence, and also to pick off countries that are currently more in a relationship with us here in the United States and in Canada, because then they'll have the influence and then they'll also have the rights to the goods and they'll also have a money a money stake in those countries. Uh, they will be vested partners. $1.3 trillion builds a few highways. Uh, the other part of this is um, the bugs. China is not done infecting world markets and other economies. China is not done. Their track record, going back on 100 years, is not good. Why would we think this is the last one that we're going to see? So, when we look at us moving forward as an industry, it's time we start calling a spade a spade. It's time we stop tiptoeing around this. Uh, let's see. Again, I will point out, you're a communist, dictatorial country. You uh, manipulate your economy uh, through various somewhat underhanded, uh, you know, Donald Trump got in trouble when he called them the currency manipulator, but they are, and they do. And also, they sign deals that they have no intention of uh, adhering to. Uh, this current trade agreement is nothing more than that. When everybody said, how come prices didn't go up? Because it's just a, a, a handshake and some paperwork, and China has never actually um, abided by any of the agreements they've made previously. It's time for us to wean ourselves off of China. I think it's bad for our health. I think China's bad for the world's health. That's an unpopular opinion. Right now, when agriculture is hurting in North America with low prices, and I know they are, don't think for a second that I don't understand the situation. I do. Uh, but China's not the answer. Always remember that old business statement. When you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank owns you. When you owe the bank a hundred million dollars, you own the bank. We got really comfortable. We got really complacent almost got lazy about just allowing ourselves to become dependent on China, and it was not lost on them. Moving forward, I wish everybody well. Thank you for tuning in to this episode. I'm Damian Mason, the author of Food Fear. These things are selling like hotcakes, folks. My clients are picking them up for their audiences. The, every day we're shipping them out to individuals. You can go to DamianMason.com. That's right there. And you can pick up ebook audiobook or hardcover. That's right. And uh, if you have a need, if you've got a meeting coming up here in the year 2020 or beyond, please look me up. I will make your meeting successful. Till next time, follow me on social media. Thanks for being here. I'll keep giving you good information. Thank you for tuning in.